Take care of the kids and the grandkids. Good evening from McDill Air Force Base and welcome to Hurricane Season 2012, a special report. I'm Storm Teammate Chief Meteorologist Steve Jervie. On behalf of Storm Teammate, it's our pleasure to bring you this special report to help you prepare for this upcoming hurricane season, which is now just days away. Our base this year is Hangar 5, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Aircraft Operations Center. That means Hangar 5 is home to Hurricane Hunter aircraft like this P3 turboprop you see here. Hangar 5 also has a long and historic past. Hangar 5 has been around almost as long as McDill. Known as McDill Field in the beginning, hangar construction began in late 1939. By early 1941, McDill hangars housed 14 Army Air Corps bomber aircraft. Early missions centered on air defense and bomber crew training. The 322nd Bomb Group trained at McDill flying B-26 Marauders was one of the first American units to attack German-occupied Holland in 1942, suffering heavy casualties. The war brought heavier bombers like the B-17 Flying Fortress to McDill for missions in Europe and the Pacific, and as many as 100,000 men and women trained here and worked in the hangars. Bombers After the war, McDill was home to the Strategic Air Command and key to keeping the Cold War cold by assuring warplanes stayed in the air and on patrol. A feature film about the Strategic Air Command starring James Stewart and June Allison was filmed in St. Petersburg. Well, here we are. At McDill and mostly in and around Hangar 5. Hey Dutch, let's go! In Strategic Air Command, just like in real life, Jimmy Stewart is a former World War II pilot. In the movie, he plays a St. Louis Cardinals third baseman who's recalled for Cold War duty. But the other 15 airplanes will prepare to fly from McDill to Japan nonstop. Since then, Hangar 5 has served the Air Force throughout the Korean and Vietnam Wars and through the first Gulf War, and even played a part in preventing McDill from closing when Congress decided to allow NOAA to transfer flight operations to Tampa. So thanks in part to Hangar 5, skies are a little more blue over McDill. The Atlantic hurricane forecast for 2012 are out. Researchers at Colorado State University released their prediction last month. They're calling for a relatively mild season. Doctors William Gray and Philip Klotzbach estimate 10 name storms this season. Four of them reaching hurricane strength and two of those becoming major hurricanes. And they put the chance of a major storm hitting the east coast of the United States or the Gulf Coast at just 24%. Stay with us. We'll be right back from MacDill Air Force Base. Last year's hurricane season was highly active with twice the number of normal tropical storms. Florida was lucky, not one hit, but this year could be different, and that thanks to water conditions and ocean away. Storm Team 8 meteorologist Brooks Garner explains why Florida could be a target this year. When assessing how active a tropical season will be, the temperature of the eastern equatorial Pacific is king. In this region, when waters become warmer than normal, as seen in red, hurricane frequency is generally reduced. The pattern is called El Nino. The main reason El Nino reduces the number of hurricanes is because of wind shear. And during the El Nino year, the jet stream will be blowing across the Gulf of Mexico, across the Caribbean, reducing the number of hurricanes because the strong winds actually shear them apart. Brian Lamar, the meteorologist in charge at the Tampa Bay National Weather Service office, says the opposite is true when those waters become cooler than normal, a pattern called La Nina. Those shearing winds dissipate, allowing tropical systems to go wild. We saw this last year. 
What we're looking at this year for 2012, we're going to be in between the two. We're leaving La Nina going into a neutral pattern. Likely resulting in a normal to slightly above normal hurricane season. While there's a defined relationship about how a warmer Pacific will reduce our hurricane count and a cooler than usual Pacific will actually up our hurricane count, there's still a great amount of uncertainty as to whether that affects the ultimate track, where the hurricanes ultimately go. And track is everything, a track determined by the steering currents rotating around a seasonally permanent area of high pressure. As we see in uh, the transition from La Nina into a neutral year, that high pressure system tends to shift to the east and it allows storms to actually come into the Gulf of Mexico. It may be that fewer tropical storms form this season than last. But what we always tell people is make sure don't really pay any attention to the numbers mm -hmm. because it only takes that one storm to change your life forever. And 20 years ago, Floridians were reminded of this when one of the slowest hurricane seasons in history in El Nino year birthed a Category 5 hurricane named Andrew. 1992 was a below normal year, yet we had one of the most powerful hurricanes on record. What do a British rock band and one of the costliest storms on record have in common? We'll let you know when we return for hurricane season 2012, a special report. It was small and ferocious and the first named storm of the season. Beside killing 40 people, Hurricane Andrew became the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history as it hit Florida 20 years ago. As a meteorologist, I came much closer to understanding and experiencing the raw power of nature as I rode out the storm in Miami. Folks down here in South Florida bracing for a huge storm. 20 years ago, I was at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, waiting for Andrew's landfall in the overnight hours of Monday, August 24th, and covering the storm for the Orlando TV station I worked for at the time. That night, I rode out the storm in the Holiday Inn next to the Hurricane Center. Wind gusts of more than 160 miles per hour sheared off part of the roof, and Andrew's heavy rain poured in. We had it pretty bad, but daybreak revealed just two miles south the beginning of catastrophe. Do not think that uh, you are in any way safe. During the storm, Brian Norcross told his viewers to cover themselves with mattresses as their homes disintegrated around them. Today, he's a hurricane specialist with the Weather Channel and remembers how unprepared he was for the damage he saw. When we got up in the helicopter over uh, this place that I had flown over many, many times, a hundred times before, I couldn't find a, a landmark that I could recognize as far as I could see, except for the ocean and the Everglades. The one that was there. Kate Hale was Dade County Emergency Manager. It turned everything upside down. The parts of the county that were hit were devastated. Uh, it was really more like a, I, th I think, a 20, 30 mile wide tornado. Ten years later, Andrew was officially upgraded from a four to a category five hurricane. It changed the insurance industry and how we construct our homes. But did the devastation of 20 years ago make anyone more prepared, more aware? It was one of those bizarre historical experiences we're never likely to see again. But the reality is we are very likely to see it again. And how do we prepare uh, populations that don't want to listen? And I think there's a huge challenge uh, that needs to be addressed in what is it that will cause people to truly change their behavior. Since Andrew, many hurricanes have hit the state. Katrina, Ivan, Charlie, Wilma, Francis, to name a few. But it was that Category 5 storm in 1992 that reintroduced modern Florida to the realities of living with tropical storms. Norcross calls Andrew the defining hurricane of the modern era. The biggest lesson of Andrew was the worst can happen. He's a man who studies weather for a living, yet he found himself in the middle of one of the century's most destructive storms. Stan Goldenberg rode out Hurricane Andrew with his family, his home destroyed around him. Yet in the midst of all this terror, they experienced a miracle. Everything hit what I call WBT, Window Breaker Special. Yeah. A meteorologist for the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA, he was watching the approach of Hurricane Andrew from a hospital room, where his wife Barbara was in labor with their fourth child. Stan Goldenberg will never forget what happened 20 years ago. It was August 24th, 1992, and the city of Miami had not taken a direct hit from a hurricane in decades. And Stan Goldenberg, who studies hurricanes for a living, was right in the path of this Category 5 storm. Because I'm already short-circuiting as a scientist, 
any major hurricane out there. Hitting land is, is the second thing, but as a father, the birth of my, you know, child, and then the fact this could actually come towards us. But it was. And we still have, waiting for the hurricane, beautiful skies, calm, you never know what was going to happen here in the next 12 to 14 hours or so. Just hours before Andrew made landfall, Little Pearl arrives safe and sound, but now Stan was worried about his three boys back home with relatives. He made the decision to leave the hospital and go home to ride out the storm. Sunday, 23rd of August, we have the family here. Looks like our TVs are out. Maybe the power is out now for the duration of this. In the hallway of the Goldenberg House, winds outside, I think, are at least 100, 110 miles an hour or more. Lord, we just thank you. We ask your protection. The front picture window smashed in, and then the back sliding door smashed out, so the hurricane started roaring through the house. As soon as that eye wall hit about 4.30 in the morning, uh, it was like as bad as it was outside, it was already hurricane force, maybe even 100 miles an hour. It's like someone took a giant gearbox and just revved the whole thing up. The freight train sound that people describe with tornadoes, it, it was there, but it kept getting louder and louder. I, people have to realize we experience winds probably close to 200 mile an hour gust. You can start to hear the roar outside. As the eye passed, they rushed to a neighbor's house, and the back half of the storm passed at daylight. But our house, which had wood shutters, the roof lifted off. And as you can see, we have no house. This is the wall. Fell on top of us. Stove down there. Cabinets all fell on top of us. And that small space you're looking at, the mattress and everything, that's where we were pinned and protected during the worst part of the storm. Back in the hospital, Stan's wife Barbara saw the damage on TV and thought no one could have survived but they were reunited several days later and began to rebuild their lives. Well, picture a hundred tornadoes hitting the city. Uh, the devastation was so vast. We figure about 200 square miles was the devastation area. Goldenberg. A meteorologist, a father, a survivor, Stan Goldenberg, linked forever. Just we're glad to be alive. To Hurricane Andrew. There's lots of tough guys in the world of rock and roll, but here's the story of one music executive whose life changed overnight as he experienced the wrath of Hurricane Andrew 20 years ago. For him, the details of that night in Miami are as clear as if they happened yesterday. These days, Andy Morris gets his kicks touring the country with the new cassettes, the up-and-coming British rock band he manages. First time that you saw the arm in Andy knows a good thing when he hears it. After all, he's worked with Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, The Stones, and other top artists. No doubt he leads a pretty exciting life. But even that can't top the night Hurricane Andrew trapped him and some friends on the fourth floor of the Hilton Fountain Blue in Miami. And I couldn't get on a flight because everyone was scrambling to get out of Miami. And so um, my friend said, you better come to the hotel and stay with us. Um, so I did. At first, he watched and waited. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon of the day, when we knew it was coming, you could see a black line on the horizon. Um, and it was pretty ominous. It was, uh, it was actually pretty scary. I, I didn't know what to expect. Hotel workers told Andy and his friends to stay in their suite and handed him a roll of tape for the windows. Not recommended nowadays. I was watching the Weather Channel, and I was specifically watching a, a weather weather forecaster, I guess, that became quite famous after the hurricane. That weather forecaster was Brian Norcross, now with the Weather Channel. Brian recently told us he became a student of hurricanes when he moved to Miami. So I thought when I became chief meteorologist of NBC there in Miami, I better uh, be ready for this because if it were to happen again, and it doesn't seem that unlikely to me, everybody's going to look at me for the answers. Whether it helped or not, there was no preparing Andy for Andrew's arrival that night. It was like standing behind a, a jet plane for like two and a half hours. It was so loud. From his room, he watched transformers blow and boats pop out of the canal. But even for someone accustomed to loud rock music, it was the sound that shook him the most. When the uh, first band came through, we did go out into the hallway 
just to see and hear what it was like, and it was, uh, it was loud. It was really, really loud. Wind, you yeah, the wind. You could hear the wind going through all of the uh, stairwells in the hotel. And when one of the, uh, one of the people that was staying in our room tried to open the door, you couldn't even actually open it because it was so, it was so powerful. The wind coming through the stairwell. Andy says he never wants to be in the path of a hurricane again. Uh, it's pretty scary. Mother Nature is really powerful. And he'll do his best to stick to excitement of the British rock variety. I'm meteorologist Brooks Garner. Coming up, NOAA takes us aboard their G4 Hurricane Hunter aircraft to show us exactly why the data they collect is so critical. It used to be the first thing people did to prepare for an approaching hurricane, taping up the windows. Now emergency managers tell us that would be the last thing to do, or better yet, don't do it at all. So it isn't the wind. People always talk about the wind. It's the stuff the wind's got in it that's going to pulverize your glass. And all the tape's doing is probably making bigger shards. But it isn't stopping that trash can. It's not stopping the neighbor's mailbox. It's not stopping the clay tiles off the roof. In fact, the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes has a new campaign telling people to go tapeless. So shutters or plywood are the way to go. This August, Republican Party delegates, the media, and even protesters will descend on Tampa Bay for the Republican National Convention. The host committee estimates at least 50,000 people will attend. 50,000 more people in for an event happening during the height of hurricane season. What if the unimaginable happen and a hurricane heads our way? News Channel 8's Samara Sotos looked into the city's extraordinary disaster preps. With preps for the Republican National Convention underway every day in Tampa, longtime residents can't help but wonder and fear the worst. I think it's going to be fun to be here at that time. Um, I'm very surprised they're even having it here in Tampa at that time of the year because that's the peak of the hurricane season. And I, you know, I haven't heard anything any comments on what the contingency is if there is a hurricane coming this way. Bill Reed is the National Hurricane Director. Good luck for the coming season. I know you have the Republican Convention there. I went through the Republican Convention in Houston in 92 during hurricane season, biting my nails. That was when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida, just days after the convention in Houston ended. This animation shows potential storm surge in downtown Tampa in a major hurricane. Every part of this year's RNC is in an evacuation zone. The RNC will draw an estimated 50,000 extra people to the Tampa Bay area. Planning involves many agencies, including the Secret Service, which is in charge of security of the nominee and dignitaries. Who decides to move the RNC out of Tampa should a hurricane threaten is a question that's not clearly answered by one leader. The decision to evacuate the city um, and any decisions affecting the city proper uh, would be made by me as mayor. Do you know who decides, okay, the convention is not going to happen anymore because of a threat of a hurricane or tropical storm? Sure, that's uh, the, the, uh, the RNC itself would make that call. That's not something that, that I would do or I think, um, I, I'm not sure exactly um, the, the entire process of who would make the final determination, but that doesn't lie with Hillsborough County. RNC officials and the Secret Service did not want to answer any specific questions about contingency plans. But Mayor Bob Buckhorn says there will be more than 300 charter buses already on hand for the delegates to get to and from the forum. They can also be used for evacuation purposes, but more transportation will be needed. Would we have to find additional vehicles to move some of the folks that don't have access to cars or taxis? Uh, probably so. We're ready to respond to whatever is happening. Hillsborough uh, County Emergency during, Operations Director Preston Cook but, says yeah, the current um, hurricane plan uh, is the same, the year, but he's still responsible for the safety of all the extra visitors in the county. Our processes won't necessarily change, but the communications process will. Is it your understanding that the Secret Service has put in place extra transportation for the extra people who will be here? Um, there's a lot of planning that's going on in terms of what the Secret Service and other entities are doing here for the RNC. Uh, for the specifics of that, though, you would really have to go to them to get those answers. Do you know what it is? Um, I've been a part of a lot of conversations and a lot of planning efforts um, as we have been preparing for the RNC here in Hillsborough County. 
Emergency officials from as far away as Orange County are on standby. In extreme cases, GOP rules allow votes to be taken by phone, computer, or other electronic means. I am almost certain by the time they're done, the, the decision point, if they have to come to one to, to, to shut her down and move people out of the way, will come at a comfortable enough time to do it correctly. For now, everyone is hoping for Tampa to only deliver its best for late August. Muggy, moist, soggy, and sticky. In Tampa, Samara Sotis, News Channel 8. This four-engine P-3 propeller plane, nicknamed Miss Piggy, is one of the planes NOAA flies into the eye of a hurricane. It's flown into Katrina and Hugo, to name just a few. The plane helps meteorologists collect data satellites can't. The job of collecting data around the hurricane falls to another aircraft, the Gulf Stream jet. Storm Team 8 meteorologist Brooks Garner takes us along for a ride. This Gulfstream G4 jet is nicknamed Gonzo. Its nose, similar to the Muppet character. On the outside, it looks like most others, except it's got a tail Doppler radar. And inside, all luxuries have been swapped out for hard-edged computer racks. But unlike its rugged counterpart, the P3. We don't fly through the storm, we fly around the storm. Trading strength for speed and range, forecasters can get a critical sneak peek of a storm's likely track before the P3s arrive to fine tune it. The G4 missions that we've flown with this Gulfstream aircraft were critical in narrowing down the spread of computer models for Hurricane Irene. Before the G4 arrived, forecast models took Irene from the Gulf to Maine. Afterward, that forecast quickly changed. All of the computer model uh, spread narrowed down to a very tight clustering of tracks, which ended up pretty much predicting exactly where the storm was going to go uh, several days ahead of time. And it helped spare hundreds of miles of coastline from possible evacuation. What we do is we, we drop these instruments from between 40 and 45,000 feet and it takes about 15 minutes to fall to the ocean surface and during that time it's measuring pressure, temperature, humidity, wind direction, wind speed. These cardboard tubes are called dropsons, short for dropped soundings. The radio transmitted data ends up here as charts and graphs. The dropsons that we release form a, a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere. As many as 45 are launched per flight. These are about $800 a piece, all the sensors, and there is a GPS receiver inside here, so the, the, they're very valuable. But if better storm tracking saves lives, then dropping them is well worth it. So uh, we prepare the song for launch uh, here in the tube. And so what's it, what's it doing inside the tube? This kind of separates the outside air from the inside, and okay. uh, once the door opens on the outside, it will pull the sand out. Successful operations up here require a team of experts. As the Gulf Stream 4 is flying into a hurricane, this back cabin has up to six people. We're talking two meteorologists, a guy working the tail Doppler, and also the drop sand equipment. And instantaneously, what they process is beamed back to the National Hurricane Center in Miami to improve forecasts. At McDill Air Force Base, I'm Storm Team 8 meteorologist Brooks Garner. Lots more to come on Hurricane Season 2012, a special report. Stay with us. forget the images. Coast Guard rescuers plucking dozens upon dozens of Hurricane Katrina victims off rooftops and out of the water, hoisting them into helicopters. The Coast Guard is in the business of saving lives, no matter what the weather. The thumbs up for the rescue swimmer. Big smile on the gentleman's face. For some, this may be the only way out after a hurricane. Following Hurricane Katrina, desperate people begged for help from rooftops. I'd never want to go through uh a hurricane in that way. Uh, I just can't imagine. Petty Officer uh, Second Class Mike did. Salter should know. We, we, He's a Coast Guard rescue swimmer trained to save lives. My job is the best job in the world, first of all. We recently <laughs> suited up and went with Salter and a Coast Guard rescue crew on board a Coast Guard H-60 helicopter for a training mission. Coast Guard's really big on safety. Practice it, preach it, live it, love it. And even though they train for the worst, 
the entire crew knows this is the last option for many. The biggest thing is to heed the warnings that are put out. Uh, and if, if you're ordered to uh, evacuate, probably your best and safest option is to do that. For our training mission, the Coast Guard crew flew two miles offshore into the Gulf of Mexico. Flying above the chartered boat Orion, a rescue swimmer, jumps into the water to simulate a life-saving mission. Another rescue swimmer is then lowered to practice picking up the victim. They'll lower me down, pick up survivors from rooftops, trees, however, the, wherever they might be, and I'll bring them back up to the aircraft safe. They train to be as safe as possible, but there are still inherent dangers when they use a large helicopter like this in an urban rescue environment. I think some people uh, just assume that we're going to be able to come in and get them out of any situation they get in, uh, but that's not the case sometimes. For pilots like Lieutenant Commander David Marama, the size of the helicopter and its forceful downwash can present its own challenges. Some of the stuff that we encounter, obviously, is uh, debris. Uh, you know, you're in close quarters around buildings, power lines, uh, loose debris, whether it's, it's we create the debris from the rotor wash or there's just debris on the ground that would, may get picked up from the rotor wash. But the entire crew knows that practice like this pays off in life and death situations as they've seen the happy reactions from the people they rescue. They're just glad to be safe and uh, they give you the thumbs up and then you know they're okay. Um, even if they're injured, you know, they'll still look in your eyes and tell you, you know, I'm okay and thank you. So it's a, it's a great reward. A great reward, but driving out of harm's way before the hurricane hits is so much easier. Jeff Patterson, News Channel 8. Backing up photos is not normally a task you'd see on a hurricane preparation list, but it should be. A hurricane can wipe out a lifetime of memories in an instant. Storm Team 8 meteorologist Megan Hatton shows us how to preserve these precious items. As Hurricane Katrina closed in on New Orleans, authorities ordered mandatory evacuations for thousands of residents, including John and Lisa Sanders, who grabbed as many precious possessions as they could hold. And she thought just at the last moment, I'll, I'll grab the, the baby books, um, the pictures of our kids when they were you know, real little. And she grabbed those two books, put those in the car, and we laughed. They soon found out those two priceless photo albums were almost all they had left after the storm. Six weeks later, I went back to New Orleans to see what was left, and it was pretty devastating. Water and mold ruined their apartment and everything in it. I think there were only one or two pictures that we were able to salvage. Physical records of many of the first for their children and their wedding gone forever. Vacations we took, we don't have those things anymore. So really what's left is what's in our memory. But they won't lose their photos ever again. Now the Sanders use a backup service called Carbonite. Their photos are stored on an online server and the backup process is easier than you think. And in less than five minutes, I had looked online, figured out the plan that I wanted to get, made, you know, bought the subscription, set up my computer, and I was done. For $59, Carbonite can be set up to automatically back up your photos and store them for one year. And so right here with just pictures alone, 12,642 pictures that I could get back if something happens to this computer. For non-digital or hard copy photos, you're going to need to plan for some extra time. Each photo will need to be scanned into your computer and saved as a digital copy. It can be a lengthy and tedious process, but... Just consider the alternative. I'd rather spend the time now than regret not making that time later. Carbonite is one of several online photo and document storage services. Photobucket, Snapfish, and Shutterfly offer unlimited manual storage for free. And social media sites like Facebook and Google Plus can even double as online photo storage too. Megan Hatton, News Channel 8. We want to thank you tonight for joining us on our special report. We also want to thank the professionals here at NOAA Air Operations and MacDill Air Force Base for their hospitality. Remember these three things to keep you and your family safe this and every hurricane season. Make a kit, make a plan, and stay informed. Good night.